Hello, everyone. Welcome to this webinar hosted by Turodex entitled How to Perform an Advanced Debugging on a Heterogeneous ARM Cortex System. My name is Raul Munoz. I'm a field application engineer at Turodex Brazil, and today I'm joined by Stefano Cardario, product manager at ARM. Hello. So, Stefano will be presenting the webinar today and explain how to perform an advanced debugging on the ARM heterogeneous multi core. Basically, he will show it on our Colibri IMAX 7. If you are not familiar with heterogeneous multi core, I would like to invite you to check our first webinar where I present the first steps with heterogeneous multi core processing. And I'm sharing right now the link in the chat box. So, just go there and check if you have the link in the message. And this is, will be a very good start if you are not familiar with this heterogeneous mood core processing. I want to thank you everyone for coming and I would like to thank also ARM for sharing this webinar with us. For those unfamiliar with Toradex, we specialize in embedded computing solution, particular ARM-based system on modules or SONs. We have two families of SONs the Colibri and Apalis, within which the modules are pin compatible and interchangeable. We perform our hardware and software development in house, and we generally guarantee 10 years product life cycle. We also offer support technical directly from our developers team, and sales is also handled directly by Torodex. Our product can be ordered right from our website. And finally, we have offices throughout the world allow us to serve the needs in the regional markets with local warehouses and local sales and technical support. Before I start, I would like to emphasize two other things about Toradex. The first one, I would like to comment about our developer website. Like I told you before, Toradex have pre-engineering support. Therefore, we try to document as many technical aspects of the product as possible in order to reduce support time for recurring questions. During our history, we have generated a very good amount of documents and articles in our developer page. I really recommend everyone to have a look in our developer.toradex.com to check our documents. The second remark is about our carrier board. Toradex sells computer on module, but we also have carrier boards we sell. The two carrier boards we, you see in the screen, we sell also in volumes. I'm emphasizing this because new customer that doesn't want to create a, their own base board can start to test the MVP, the minimal viable product, using our boards. And then in the future, if you see that your product is well accepted in the market, or even if you just need to add any feature, I mean hardware feature, you can just use our board as a reference design and then you can create your own. All our carrier boards are open project and it's available at developer.toradex.com. If you want to create your own design, I strongly recommend you to have a look in our designs. If you want to start with Toradex and are you looking for something more focused on development, we also have the Colibri Evaluation Board. This is a very complete carrier board where you can open and change most part of the circuit. It will help you to do a very complex prototyping, so you can really disconnect to what we have and connect to what you want. And for this board, we also have the reference design, so I really recommend you to have a look. Some months ago, we also released a new evaluation board called Aster Carrier Board. This is also a great platform to start development with Toradex, and this is also the carrier board Stefano will use today. Apart from the price that is much more attractive, Aster has a connector that makes it compatible to the Raspberry Pi header and another that allows you to connect it with Arduino's shoes. I add here some GIFs that can explain you what's possible to do with this platform. For example, the first GIF we have here is a GPS shoot from the Arduino compatible that you can just connect it to the board. And the second one is a SPI display, also it's Arduino compatible. And the third one, it's another one with a couple of push buttons and also some LEDs and there is also a, a very small display. And finally, even you can even use it as a breadboard and you can 
quickly connect with, it, with our boards and do what you want for the prototypes. Now I will ask Stefano to start the webinar. And if you guys have any question during the, during the webinar, I would like to ask everyone to write me in the question box and I will try to, to answer by text during the webinar and I will choose the better question for the end. We have also a couple of uh, boards out of the shelf from our hardware partners. So if there is any, if our carrier boards doesn't fit for your projects, we have in our website a lot of carrier boards. You can easily go there and see if anyone fits for your project. So uh, you you probably find someone that will help you in your project. So now I would like to welcome Stefano and pass the control to Stefano. So thank you for the introduction, Raul. Um, as I said, my name is Stefano Cadario and I'm a product manager at ARM. I'm, I'm based in the um, Cambridge UK office uh, and I'm a product manager for uh, the um, um, TSMDK, which is the product for heterogeneous devices. Um, today, I'm going to talk about uh, what are the advantage of using um, heterogeneous devices. Um, I'm going to talk a bit, a little bit about interprocessor communication, which is one of the things that um, you, you need to uh, to know when you work with heterogeneous devices. And then I'm going to talk about um, how tools and, and in particular development tools can help uh, to uh, develop your project and debug and, 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 and spot your bugs basically in your or in, in your project. At the end, we're going to have um, a, a summary and we're going to leave some time for, uh, for a, a Q&A. So if you have um, any question, please feel free to write that in the chat box and uh, I'll, we will try to, um, to answer during the session or after the, the session if necessary. Okay, without further ado, let's, let's get started. Um, so um, the ARM architecture is normally considered one ARM architecture, but actually there are different profiles um, uh, based on the need that you have. Um, the most common one is the Cortex-A profile or Cortex-A architectures. Um, normally Cortex-A cores are um, optimized for um, high performance and they normally run a rich operating systems and normally we find Cortex-A processor in mobile phones for example or routers um, and lately maybe servers. Um, the um, characteristic of this um, processor are obviously high performance as well as having an MMU um, so um, which is uh, required for um, advanced operating systems such as Linux. Uh, another profile that we we have is uh, the Cortex R. Um, Cortex R are optimized for high performance again, but uh, this time for real time applications. Um, this means that in this case we don't have an MMU in the in the uh, processor. Um, this is to uh, optim to make sure that the processor is fast when re uh, responding to an interrupt. So this uh, what we call the fast interrupts to to make sure that um, um, real-time application uh, are, are handled properly. Um, we will find we find normally this type of processor in hard drives or automotive or robotics. Um, again, this is for hard real-time application. Um, last but not least, we have Cortex-M processor. Um, these are the smallest um, and lowest power. Um, they are optimized for uh, microcontrollers. So normally, uh, the majority of microcontrollers are, are based on the Cortex-M processor, and we find these devices for um, we find this processor for IoT devices such as uh, intelligent light bulb or um, um, smart watches or a sports band and, and any basically microcontroller you, you, you will find. Um, then um, if we talk about the um, modern computer systems, uh, we know that um, we have different workloads required during the, um, the time of usage. Um, so if we take a mobile phone, for example, uh, for the majority of the time, the mobile phone is on stand in standby. So that means that it's ready to receive calls or receive texts and messages, but it, it, it doesn't require much computational power. And um, whenever the user is taking the phone and is surfing on the web, for example, or playing Angry Birds. In this case, the power required is much higher, um, so the processor needs to be hand to be able to handle um, high performance as well as um, low power when when performance is not required. Um, if you talk about a smart watch, we have exactly the same situation where um, during the um, um, when I, I'm 
basically I'm not using the watch, I'm not looking at the watch, um, the processor doesn't need to do much, it just needs to take care of um, handling and interrupts. Uh, but when I'm interacting with the watch, maybe because I'm looking at the weather and I'm checking uh, various things on the watch, um, the power required is, is, is much higher. So as we can see, there are different workloads that are applied at different time, even for the same device. So this is exactly the reason why um, heterogeneous devices have been created. Um, on the a typical heterogeneous devices like an I, uh, NXP IMX7, we have a, a Cortex-A processor uh, running a, a, a bridge OS, and it's normally Linux, and this is uh, used to run complex application with uh, maybe some uh, support sophisticated um, GUIs and sophisticated uh, human machine interface. Um, then on the other side, we have a, a Cortex-M processor. A Cortex-M processor, uh, as I mentioned earlier, is uh, mostly a microcontroller processor, so has normally fast startup time because there's an Artos running on it. It's very low power compared to the Cortex-A processor and it has um, low I.O. latencies because it has been optimized for um, RTOS and microcontroller applications. Um, these two cores, or the two or more cores, are um, in the same chip. So uh, the NXP IMX7, for example, has a dual Cortex-A7 um, on, on the Cortex-A side and a single Cortex M4 on the M side. These two cores, or two systems, share the same peripherals, so both can access to all peripherals and share the same memory. So both can potentially access to the same memory. And this is exactly how the two systems communicate between each other. Um, having shared memory, they can uh, basically communicate by writing and reading uh, from the same area of memory. And this is how we um, perform um, interprocessor communication. In terms of use cases for HMP devices, we have um, obviously industrial um, and uh, consumer, for example, if we take the Nest, um, or medical. So if we take the um, and heart rate monitor in a hospital, uh, for the majority of the time, the device just needs to monitor the heart rate of the patient. So there's no um, high performance, um, require, high performance um, required in that. Um, when the doctor comes and wants to look at the log file, wants to look at the um, history of the heart rate of the patient, then the GUI might, might need to be uh, powered up. Uh, I want to check the, uh, maybe look at a database, so a bit more performance is required um, during, during, during this. By, um, when we develop software on the, uh, um, on the heterogeneous devices, we have different challenges. Um, one of the challenges that we have um, is task partitioning. So for example, if we take a specific task, such as monitor the heart, the heart rate of the patient, um, deciding on where this task should be executed is one of the issues that a software developer needs to take care of. Um, so sometimes this is a balance between uh, low power or um, how, reactive, it should be this um, uh, this task, uh, as well as the um, uh, power or the uh, performance required by, by this task. Some tasks can't be um, um, done by or performed by the Cortex-M processor because not powerful enough. Um, so um, another issue that we have is data sharing. So how can we make sure that the uh, software running on the Cortex M, M, M processor is communicating correctly with the uh, software running, uh, normally Linux running on the um, Cortex A. Um, and how do we make them communicating? How do we make the communication coherent? And how can we make sure that we don't corrupt data in this process? Last but not least, and this is mainly the focus of this presentation, is how do I develop software in that? Um, obviously, one of the challenges we have is um, having two system, two different systems running on the same chip, but um, the developer is one, so we need to be able to uh, do the development on both um, um, system at the same time to understand what could, uh, what is going wrong and what um, um, what can be uh, the interaction between between the two uh, the two devices, the two calls. Sorry. Um, so, in terms of complexity, I already mentioned we have two. Um, mainly two operating systems running on the on the same device. So normally we have Linux running on the Cortex A7, but it could be an Artos as well, um, or we have um, an, an Artos normally or an MCU application running on a Cortex M4. Um, another challenge is being able to debug 
the Biometra code, which is running on the Cortex M4, um, as well as the Linux application, which may be running on in the, the user space uh, on the top of the uh, Linux operating systems. Um, last but not least, uh, probably the most um, challenging one is uh, managing the communication between the Linux application and the bare metal application. How can we make sure that the communication is, is, is going well? How can we make sure that no data is corrupted? Uh, how can we make sure that um, this is um, done in a, a timely fashion? Um, those are the uh, kind of um, issues or, or challenges that we have when we develop software on heterogeneous devices. So if we talk about specifically communication between the Cortex-A system and the Cortex-M system, um, one way of doing uh, of doing this is um, writing the um, all um, by, by by yourself. So uh, we will need to write a, a Linux kernel module. Um, this is because we need to be able to access to uh, the memory in uh, directly. We can't be um, um, use the uh, Linux kernel basically that would hide um, some of the um, um, the, the memory uh, basically access. So we need to write a kernel module, which is already challenging for, by, by by itself. Um, so we will need to know a bit more about the uh, Linux kernel. We need to know a bit more how to debug Linux kernel module and so on. Um, also, we need to make sure that when we write the kernel module, we manage concurrency. So we need to make sure that we handle the interrupts coming from um, the other systems correctly. We need to make sure that no data is corrupted, as I mentioned earlier. On a bare metal side, we have similar kind of problems. So um, we, um, even though we have direct access to the, uh, the the memory because this is bare metal pretty much, or, or with an Atos, uh, we will need to anyway manage concurrency. How can we make sure that data is not corrupted one way to the other, so read or write? Um, and also, we need to handle inter interrupts and, and, and so on. Um, if you have an Atos as well, you will need to do the integration with Atos as well. So this is quite challenging, um, but um, what uh, um, norm, customers normally do is um, using um, a library. Um, um, NXP and, and various other producers have um, uh, released uh, OpenAMP and OpenMessage. Uh, OpenAMP is a library which allows you to simplify the communication between the Linux system or the Linux application and the MCU application. So what we're going to find in there is um, a, a Linux kernel module, which is called RP message module, uh, which takes care of uh, um, handling the um, memory and the um, concurrency um, in, in, in on the Linux side, um, as well as a library. We have a library on the um, Cortex-M4, which can be easily uh, accessed. So we have a, a few functions that we're going to see uh, later in this presentation that can be called directly by the MCU application um, to read or write messages between the Linux application and the MCU application. Um, the RP message library is um, um, available as a CMCS pack. So that means we're going to see how it's very easy, uh, effectively, um, to integrate the um, RP message module in your application. And uh, the SMDK provides also examples on how you can um, use this in your, in your application. So um, in this screen, we, we have uh, um, a, a Colibri IMX7 uh, module, which is um, the module that I'm, I'm using at this moment uh, for, for, the, for the demo uh, later. Um, so we have a Linux kernel and the Linux application, um, and we will see the RP message models is effectively creating a, a virtual pipe in the shared memory and is exposing the virtual pipe through uh, TTY uh, device, um, so slash dev slash TTY RP message. Um, this is quite easy from the Linux application to interact with because this is just a terminal. Uh, that means that we just need to read and write from this terminal and everything we read and everything we write will be uh, passed to the MCU application automatically. On the other side, on the MCU application, um, we have a few functions that can be used to initialize the virtual pipe again, uh, make sure that this is synchronized with the kernel module, and receive a message coming from the Linux application, and send a message. So when the MCU application is sending a message to the Linux application. Uh, on the Cortex M4, um, on the Cortex A7, we have Linux kernel, as we said. On the Cortex M4, um, at the moment, we have three Artos running with a thin layer um, um, CMCS Artos 2. Uh, the CMCS Artos um, 2 um, 
layer, adapter layer, allows um, to um, abstract the um, application, the MCU application you're writing, uh, and use Atos agnostic um, functions, basically, or all applications. Um, that means that if um, later I want to swap uh, between free Atos and RTX5, I can simply do it without changing the MCU application. This would be abstracted from the um, CMC's Atos um, layer. So what I have here on my desk is, uh, as uh, Raoul said, uh, I've got a Toradex Aster board uh, with a Colibri IMX7 dual um, uh, module. Uh, I have uh, connected, uh, obviously, power, a USB serial port. The USB serial port um, is used uh, for the uh, interacting with the uh, Linux console. Um, I also have an Ethernet uh, cable connected and connected to my computer so that I can uh, connect via TCP IP to the uh, Linux running on the board. Um, and I have a, a, J, a DStream SD, uh, in this case, which is a hardware debugger connected to uh, um, through the JTAG 10 um, connector to the Aster board. Uh, this allows me to basically connect directly to the um, IMX app chip and do all the debug that I need to do, bare metal, Linux kernel, and then so on. Uh, um, obviously, the stream SD in this case uh, is connected by USB in my case, but it can be used on F Ethernet as well, for example, if you have a server farm. Um, um, I'm using here a D stream SD just for convenience, but you can use a Ulink Pro or any other probe that is compatible with the SMDK. So we're going to see in the uh, demo how um, the SMDK allows you to connect uh, with uh, the Cortex-M application running on the system, as well as the uh, debug, the Linux kernel, and the Linux kernel module, always via the DStream or Ulink Pro. Um, and we can finally connect with the um, Linux system, with the Linux user space application uh, via TCP IP. This is using GDB server to connect to, to that. OK. So let's start the demo. Let me show my screen. Here we go. You should be able to see my screen right now. So um, the SMDK is based on the Eclipse environment. So um, if you are familiar with that, you will find the same editor, uh, pretty much. So you're familiar with Project Explorer and so on. Uh, but um, obviously, it's a personalized. So has a couple customized uh, with uh, further um, ap applications and, and compilers. So for example, we don't use the GCC compiler, even though you can if you want, but we include the high performance um, ARM compiler, uh, both ARM compilers 5 and ARM compiler 6 um, if you want, um, as well as the um, debugger. The debugger is based on the DSI debugger, uh, is a multi-core, a multi-processor debugger, which is very powerful as you can see um, in a minute. So the first thing I want to show you is the CMC's pack manager. Uh, the CMC's pack manager allows you to uh, go through all the um, um, CMC's packs available. So these are the list of devices supported as a CMC's packs. Um, in this case, in, in case of the SMDK, uh, we support the heterogeneous devices only at this point. And um, so we support IMX6, IMX6, 6 series, IMX7 series, as well as the old Vibrid, uh, what we used to be called Vibrid, so VF50 and VF60 um, series. In this case, we have um, the um, IMX7 dual, um, but I can do even better. Uh, because I have a Toradex board in here, I've got a Colibri, I can go on the board and I can select exactly my um, board from, from, from the menu. Um, this will show me um, the um, support packs or CMC packs that I need to do my uh, debug and development, uh, and I can install um, to be used in the project. And it shows me all the examples specifically for the uh, Colibri IMX7 board. So whenever I selected a board and I select the example, I have all the examples already available just for that um, um, board. So um, if I want to uh, include this in my workspace, uh, or I can just click on copy, and I can confirm that I want this imported, and the SMDK will immediately import it and make this available to me. 
Um, so um, one of the things that we, we mentioned earlier in the, in the slides that um, the RP message is basically a library that which allows us to communicate with the Linux system. So we have a, a kernel module on the Linux side, but we have a, a normal C libraries that we can call uh, or C functions that we can call on the Cortex M4 side. So um, this is a simple application, uh, it has a main and one of the tasks that it executes is called string echo task. And string echo task is um, this function. So uh, the string echo task function um, has a few uh, calls to RP message library. Uh, the first thing it does is initializing the channel. Um, so this allows us to uh, create the RP message channel or the funnel uh, to the uh, um, Linux system. And then we have other um, functions that we can use, for example, to receive a message. So this function effectively receives a, a message uh, coming from the Linux system, as well as um, a writing, uh, I'll, well, this allocate the, uh, the buffer and, and sending a message uh, to, to the Linux system. So as you can see, it's, it's, it's quite um, a trivial, it's just a, a function call pretty much. And um, we got examples, so um, you can import uh, uh, the example easily and see how that works and then you can uh, apply this to your application. So the first thing we want to do, um, I prepared already this project before the demo. Uh, we're gonna click the, clean up the environment and we're gonna build the project. So now the project is, is building, in this case it's using ARM Compiler 5 um, for, for the project, but we could potentially use ARM Compiler um, 6 um, or, or GCC if, if you wanted. Here we go. In this case, uh, the um, compiler is compiling actually everything. So it's compiling uh, the example as well as free autos from, from, from scratch. So that's why it takes a while. while it's compiling, um, I can also show um, the um, RT configuration. Um, this is basically the option menu for the um, project. Um, in this menu, I can select uh, for my specific project, which board is, is actually su supported. So which um, uh, board support package basically I import and I want to use for uh, this example. I can select which Artos I want to use. In this case, um, I'm using the CMC's Artos 2 APIs and the free Artos version. So potentially I can use the Kyle RTX 5 if I wanted. And on the Artos side, again, I'm saying, I'm config doing the configuration here to make sure that it's using the um, Artos 2 uh, layer. Um, OpenAMP, again, this is something else that we need to select. This is basically the library uh, that we need to use for RP message. Uh, we don't need to do much, we just need to import, make sure that this pack is installed, which we can do from a SEMSYS pack manager and select it in my project so that the project is able to use it. And all the dependencies and libraries would be resolved automatically for you. Let me close a few window. Here we go. Now that we have the project built, um, we want to debug it. So actually before debugging, just make sure that um, the Linux um, is um, rebooted. So we want to get back to um, U-boot. So the first thing you want to do um, is to connect to the Linux terminal. I've got already connected here, but I can show you how to connect. Um, as I mentioned earlier, the Colibri, um, oh sorry, the Aster board has a USB cable. Um, and this is uh, seen on, on your system as a virtual serial port. The virtual serial port is connected directly uh, to the uh, output of the Linux um, system so that I don't need to open a new window or uh, anything else basically and uh, everything can be done in the, in the SMDK. I just select the right serial port. In this case, I know that this is COM4 um, and when I connect, I basically have my uh, Linux system uh, ready. Um, so let's reboot this so that we can stop it at the uh, U-boot. So now Linux is rebooting and I need to make sure that I press the button before um, U-boot starts or before the Linux um, kernel auto starts uh, when, it's, um, uh, when it's rebooted. Okay, so uh, we know that now we have uh, the device stopped at U-boot. And what we want to do, we can start a debug session. So we select the project for the M4, uh, we select the CMSYS um, 
uh, debug configuration. Uh, in this case, we want to select the Distream ST, which is the um, device I have uh, connected at this point. Uh, as you can see, it's connected as via USB. Uh, we select the device. Um, we got a target configuration. Maybe it's not really re relevant now, but you can um, set up all the uh, information about uh, details about your uh, trace, for example, or your uh, connection uh, to the to the target. Um, most importantly, we want to make sure that this is using the right um, image that has been created by the system. And in this case, the configuration is um, um, allowing us to download the uh, image and start uh, and breakpoint and main. So um, we will see, uh, basically we'll start, the debug will start, the debug session will start from directly from main without the initialization part. Um, very importantly, um, I selected here the free Atos OS awareness. Uh, I know that this is running free Atos, so I want to enable the free Art, the free Atos OS awareness because it gives us some more, um, as you can see, we're going to see later, uh, some more information um, to uh, to debug my project. So um, now that this is all set up, let's press debug and let's start to uh, the debug session. So it's now the device is now connecting, it's downloading the image and waiting for stopping at main. And here we go. So um, as you can see in the window, in the window we have the um, um, debug connection connected, but stopped at breakpoint. In this case, it stopped at main. Um, this is because how I set it up uh, on the um, um, debug configuration. Um, and what we want to do, we let it run. Um, so that the free autos is actually initialized, and we just briefly stop it, and we see what what we can see. So I stopped the M4. Um, the um, Linux kernel is actually not, oh sorry, the Cortex A processor is actually not affected at this point. So we can run independently um, the Cortex M4 and the Cortex A7. This is um, almost um, almost always the case uh, with IMX IMX7. I can always independently run one or the other. Um, as I mentioned, when we have the OS awareness enabled, uh, we can see the list of the uh, tasks. We can see uh, further information uh, when we run the, um, the, the project. So one of the things that we can see, for example, is the list of tasks running in free autos. Uh, we can see mutexes uh, available or open at the moment, uh, queues, or the kernel configuration if you want to explore um, the kernel configuration in, in there. So um, this is quite interesting uh, because we can see uh, the tasks running, and this can be really useful, especially when we are um, we have more than uh, let's say three tasks. Um, but I want to show another aspect, another advantage of using the SMDK is uh, the functionality to um, see actually threads um, directly in the connection. Um, this is available for um, free, uh, sorry, for free autos for. Um, um, Artosis uh, as well as Linux. Um, so we have this exactly the same view here. So we gonna we can see the two the three threads, the same threads we can see on the OS view. Um, but one thing that we want to know, for example, is where each thread has been stopped to. So where, for example, this string echo task is stopped to. So if we click on it, the system will exactly go to the um, program counter, uh, set it up for the uh, this specific task. But this doesn't tell us much. Um, the reason for that is because this is just a, 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 a function call to the um, free autos to basically switch to another task. So it doesn't tell us much. But we can always see the, the stack, which gives us um, a view on the uh, call stack. So if we look at here, we can actually see exactly um, if we go up on the um, stack or down on the stack, we can see that the um, actually this task stopped at the RP message autos in it. In this case, the uh, firmware is actually waiting, uh, or the image is waiting for the uh, Linux kernel to uh, create the channel. So it's just waiting there for the RP message kernel module to to be created. Okay, so. Um, we know that this is this is now working. This is just uh, waiting right now. So we're gonna continue, let you run. And one of the things we want to do is just boot Linux now. So we're gonna uh, type boot in the uh, uBoot terminal, and this will um, start Linux. So you can see um, 
Linux are booting up. Here we go. So we we are now reached the uh, login um, console uh, or login prompt. Um, so at the moment, as you see, the M4 is still connected. Uh, it's not moving from there, um, and I want to connect to the kernel debug. Uh, to, sorry, to the uh, to the Linux um, um, kernel, basically. Um, so I set it up a, a project already on a kernel uh, called kernel debug. Uh, in this project, I put the uh, VM Linux, which basically includes all the um, symbols uh, for the Linux kernel running currently on the system. Um, I have a couple of scripts that helps me to set it up. Uh, the um, very simple script, to be honest, uh, to set up the um, um, Linux kernel module uh, loading and and and, and um, connection. I also have the um, source code for the Linux kernel modules for the uh, RP message kernel module that we're gonna load and is uh, tasked to create the uh, TTY RP message as well as the um, symbols that we need when we do debug. So again. This is all uh, set up already. We just want to connect. Here we go. It's now connecting and stopping the target. Um, so one of the things that we notice immediately is that the Cortex-M4 is still running. It hasn't been affected at all by the connection and the dual A7 is now stopped. So in this case, the um, we can see that the um, the two processors are actually uh, waiting on, on on idle, so they're not doing any anything really. Um, so um, we can we can just uh, proceed and we can just continue with that. But before doing that, I want to show you um, a, a special um, things that um, the SMDK has done. I instructed the debugger to load the kernel module symbols uh, because we want to debug to be able to debug the new kernel module and and what is saying here is the operating system module imx rp message tty.ko is currently not loaded so the request has been pended and um, was it was it what it's telling us uh, the smdk is telling us is that the module is not there hasn't been loaded and we know that and uh, uh, we can now continue that and um we and the um, um, sorry the um, the module has a, has a build order and we can check immediately this by um, logging into the Linux system and if we do ls mod we can see that um, IMX RP message uh, module is not there um, the dev TTY RP message is not there either. Um, we know that, and the, uh, the SMDK is able to understand that is Linux is running on the systems by, by looking at the symbols uh, in the symbol table, um, and is able to detect if uh, what kind of modules are loaded or not. Um, so um, another things that we we can do now is just load the Linux kernel module. So we type mod probe imx underscore rp message tty. This is the name of the module. And once we clicked, here we go. Um, what's what's happened here? So actually, we notice the Cystic kick lander, uh, the uh, actually the Cystic handle uh, uh, timeout. So uh, I got a breakpoint on that. That's why it uh, breakpoint there. But uh, what happened is that the um, the SMDK is telling us the loading operating system module symbols. IMX RP message TTY has happened. So the, the SMDK handled or understood that the module has been now loaded and it tell, is telling us um, this. Um, how does it do that? Um, the SMDK creates um, three uh, internal uh, breakpoints automatically when you when it detects it's Linux, which can be disabled anyway, but um, by default it it creates these three breakpoints. And these three breakpoints are exactly the um, handling of the uh, loading and deleting of the modules. So this is exactly how the SMDK is able to um, handle this, this, this um, uh, well, detecting that the Linux scanner module is loaded or not. Here we go. We also seen that the um, Cortex-M4 uh, software uh, name service and shake is done. And 
for has set up our RP message channel. Uh, this is because we loaded the module, so the RP, uh, M4 code is not waiting for that anymore. It has the code, it has, sorry, the, the, the channel, and it can start to communicate. The same thing we're gonna see, uh, we, we can see in the, um, I am, um, in the Linux kernel module. So in this case, we know that um, the kernel module is downloaded. We can see IMX RP message TTY here, and we can see that the dev TTY RP message has been now created. So we can, we are now able to do the communication between the Cortex M4 and the Linux um, kernel system. And one of the things we want to do now is uh, making sure that if we send something uh, to the uh, to the uh, Cortex M4, uh, we handle it and we uh, breakpoint in that. So we're gonna stop the target. We're gonna set up a breakpoint exactly here. Um, this is um, a part of the code where the message has been actually already received and we're gonna see that this is gonna be printed out and is doing some uh, lead uh, change uh, based on what I write on the um, message. So uh, now that I put the breakpoint, I can let you run. So the M4 is still running um, and let's start to write a message. So we do echo um, LED one and then we set the status. In this case, I want an off because at the moment uh, I can see on the board is on. So we print the message LED one space zero and we print it, we, sorry, we pipe it to TTY RP message. So I press enter and that's what happened. Um, the Linux kernel sent the, uh, or the Linux kernel module handled the message and is sent already to the M4. Um, the M4 handled the message or uh, received the message from uh, this function. RP message authors received no copy and is now reaching this point. Um, this um, actually effectively tested us the, uh, the functionality. Um, if you look at the variables, for example, um, the uh, STR buffer variable is showing us that this is exactly the message I sent uh, from the Linux kernel. So we tested the whole system now uh, and that the communication is working from one side to the other. So I remove the breakpoint and I can let it run. Um, so um, another things that um, we want to do, um, you know, I have the console and I use the echo to write the, the message, but effectively what we want to do is a Linux application doing that. Um, so before um, doing that, uh, we want to use, we want to connect to the remote system, so to the Linux system running on, on the device. And what I'm gonna do, I'm gonna copy the IP address because this is gonna happen um, via TCP IP. I select SSH only, and host name, I just need to put the IP address and this is connecting now. So um, one of the advantage of using the remote system within the SMDK is the ability to access directly to the upper, to the file system. So I just put my user ID, well, the root user ID um, as configured in the uh, Linux image and I can immediately access to the uh, file system that I have on the Linux uh, device. Um, this is quite useful uh, if you want to uh, move and or uh, copy some files over, um, some some extra files that you want to move on the on, on the Linux device, you wouldn't need any extra application, you, want, you don't need any um, SCP, for example, command to transfer files, you just have to drag, you just do drag and drop um, into the file system and this is already uh, transferred for you. Um, so this is, which is quite convenient. So um, if you remember at the beginning, I copied the uh, Linux application example. Uh, this is an example which is not related to the demo, but we can change it to make it work. Um, what this example does is basically open um, the um, port, uh, so all writing a, a message hello from A7 in this case uh, to the TTYRP message. So we want to change this. Uh, we're gonna write exactly the same message. This time we're gonna uh, power that on. So we do LED one and we do space one. In this case, we're gonna turn it on. We don't need to read the message back. So we're gonna delete this part. We're gonna save the project and build the project. In this case, it's using GCC because effectively this is just a user space Linux application and this is what GCC is for. Um, 
which is already included in the SMDK in, in any case. Um, so uh, another thing we want to start is the debug. So uh, we're going to right click on this, uh, debug as, and we go to the debug configuration because we want to configure this. Uh, we have in DS5 debugger in this case, uh, we have to select the TCP IP connection to use, which we set up uh, a couple of minutes ago. Uh, we have the IP address in this case, this is the name of the uh, connection, and we can start to debug um, immediately. This is um, actually already done. As you can see, we connected, uh, the M4 is still connected and running, the Kernel debug, so the dual A7, still connected and running, and this time we had the third connection. The third connection is the um, via GDB server, so it's using this T, uh, TCP IP uh, channel um, to uh, connect via GDB server and download the, 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 the um, application. So if I run this Linux application, I can see that the uh, LED is changing. So the uh, uh, the firmware running on M4, uh, which is linked to the app console in this case, is um, changing the status. So I, I removed the breakpoint, so it's not breaking, doing a breakpoint anymore, but it's changing the status on here. And this is quite convenient because uh, what I can test with the SMDK is end-to-end -end, um, connection. So I can test from the Linux application from where the message has been generated till the end. So when the Cortex M4 is actually receiving the message and doing something uh, with, with that message. Of course, we can have more complex breakpoints. So we can um, make um, conditional, for example, breakpoints based on conditions that are not just on the debug session on the M4, for example, but we can make a condition on the breakpoint uh, based on a different um, system. So if we can breakpoint M4 only if the A7 uh, is uh, doing something, uh, um, it has uh, some variable, uh, some uh, some value. So we, we can do really uh, uh, complex debug uh, with, with, with the SMDK, um, so to, which, is, which is quite powerful for that. Another thing uh, really quickly that I want uh, you to show is the ability to uh, debug the uh, Linux kernel module. As, was, as, you, as, as I said uh, earlier, um, the, um, uh, the SMDK is able to um, load and do uh, breakpoints uh, or doing debug of Linux kernel module. So what we want to do, uh, if we have, for example, issues uh, with the uh, Linux kernel module, um, we can uh, simple, uh, simply stop it and put the breakpoint um, on the uh, right, for example. Uh, this is the part of the kernel module handling the right. So I can um, double click. Oh, sorry, it's loading the global variables from, from Linux. It takes a while uh, because there are um, 9,000 variables apparently, <laughs> or five static 26,000 variables. So it's taking a bit to do this. Here we go. Yeah, um, now it, it set the breakpoint uh, on the kernel module. We let the uh, Linux system running again. So this is now live. And we write a similar message, so LED10. And we can see that um, when we uh, send a message, uh, the um, Linux kernel or the debug session on the Cortex A7 is actually blocked exactly where um, we um, we wanted uh, to 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 be blocked, and we can have uh, obviously the visibility on what the buffers and the variables of the Linux kernel uh, module um, have, and we can do our debug, our development. And uh, this obviously applies to not just Linux kernel modules, it applies also to the Linux kernel as well. Um, the SMDK is able to handle from start to the end, so um, you could potentially um, and and some customers. To, um, debug the U-boot if you are um, editing that, if you are doing some modification on U-boot or you're doing some modification on the Linux kernel, uh, you can use the SMDK to debug uh, both because we have started connection to the core site of the um, of, of the Cortex A7. Okay, um, this is at the end of the demo. 
So in, in, in summary, um, um, we talked about the uh, each region's devices um, and uh, we saw how it combines the best of both worlds. So we have a Linux, uh, a feature-rich Linux for a GUI and, and uh, we have an MCU for um, an Atos, ex uh, everything on the same chip. And we, we have seen how um, CMCs can speed up your development by using standard components. Um, so the op RP message and so on are available on the as as CMC's pack so that they can be integrated in your project and we can and we have seen how uh, the SMDK is able to handle uh, multi-core debug support not only on the hardware side but also on the uh, Linux uh, application side so um, we got some time now about 10 minutes for um, Q&A if you want to get an evaluation version of the SMDK you can get it uh, you just go to uh, www.cal.com uh, MDK5 and the SMDK um, and just uh, and the SMDK is part of the MDK uh, professional or MDK plus edition so if you already have this product, um, you can just download the SMDK from the website and this would use um, the um, license you have already, so you don't need to purchase a separate product. Thank you very much, Stefano, uh, for your presentation. Let's uh, see the questions here. The first one is, what tools, hardware and software do I need to have to reproduce what you show us today? Sure. So. Um, I I can get back to this these this, uh, slides. So um, as I mentioned, we have a, a Toradex Asterboard with a um, Colibri IMX7 module. Um, we have also a Disream SD debugger in this case, but any uh, debugger compatible can be used. So if you have Ulink Pro, for example, you can use Ulink Pro, or if you have Disream, you can use um, Disream. Um, it's up to you. Um, and the in terms of software, um, we um, use the Linux uh, image. And we plan to release the example that I showed you today um, in a in a CMC's pack. So in the in the next couple of weeks, uh, we should have uh, the example uh, as a CMC's pack, um, and that means that you can simply import your example as I've shown you earlier. You select the Colibri board and you get to the uh, to the example um, in here. So it would be a couple of more examples here, and you can just copy into your workspace, build it, and debug it uh, on the front scratch. I know also that the session would be recorded, so all the instructions would be um, you know you can re retry to reproduce all the sessions. Okay, cool. So just another question here is: Is the open AMP and RPMSG and open source code. So uh, yes, you can find the RPMSG model code in the kernel code. So it's open. And I think that open AMP is also a open project. So it's you can you don't need to care about it. So it's easy to find the code. Just another question here, Stefano. Is the whole webinar was really advanced and people want to know if you can also use the tools and what you did today for more simple and for development and also there is another question here let me co just connect it uh, another guy is asking that you you are using the ds mdk in eclipse example so can you explain again yeah so um so in terms of um, um what it can be done with the smdk um so what i show you is uh, fairly advanced use of the SMDK um, in, in terms of um, I showed you the Linux kernel uh, module debug and and, and 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 so on which can be um, kind of daunting sometimes because there are two different debug sessions running at the same time uh, but um, of course it's impossible to um, use the SMDK or you know, for, for, for simple uh, debug. So if you have, for example, um, you don't want to uh, take care of the um, Linux and you know that that's is sorted out, you don't want to, to look at that, or you're using Linux image with the um, OpenAMP or RP message module that is working, so it's completely fine. You can just do the debug on 4 if you want. Um, and, and 
yeah, so it's 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 easy to do that as well. Uh, in terms of environment, um, we we use Eclipse in terms of a container, so it has the uh, facilities of you know or the ability to add plugins to Eclipse. But this is um, the SMDK case is just based on Eclipse. So um, the debugger, for example, is not uh, it's not using the uh, normal uh, debugger that you will find in Eclipse, and the compiler is using ARM compiler, so it's a bit more complex. And it's it's you know it's it's um, designed exactly for heterogeneous devices. So there's a there's 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 a bit more work in that. Yeah. So there is another funny question is like how can the Cortex M4 connect to the I'm dot max seven peripherals like GPIO, I square C and uh, and SPI GPIO stuff like that. So in the end the Cortex M4 is really inside the uh, the I'm dot max seven. So uh, and also there is a share bus that allow the both cars to access the peripherals. So you can e really touch the peripherals at the same time and you you need to care about this to don't crash your system. So do, do you have any other thing to, to comment about this, Stefano? No, that's 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 quite yeah, that's 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 correct. So the Cortex M4 um so actually both cores are um can access to um the whole memory address. Uh, the only thing you can is limited uh, is by um, the configuration file when you uh, basically first uh, boot the uh, the system. So you can decide to limit access uh, on um, either core to part of the memory, but uh, but you can also give access to to to, to everything. What um, customers normally do is um, giving um, a kind of a small space for the Cortex M4 because normally the um, a memory required by the M4 is, is smaller, um, and the rest to the Linux uh, to the Linux uh, system. And then the, uh, there's a, a bit of shared memory that is used basically for the RP message communication. Yeah, there is another question here. Is more for uh, is the DSMDK a different product from the MDK plus product? Uh, because so, the guy man mentioned that he already have the license for the MDK plus. So okay, so what it means? So it's a different. A product, um, but uh, if you have MDK Plus, you are entitled to use the SMDK. So you won't need to purchase uh, something else. You just go on a website. You can download the SMDK, and then when the when the the installation or when you launch the product, it would ask um, where's the license key. Um, and then if you point to the um, MDK um, license, it will, it will start to work. Um, in the, the latest version, uh, you, if you have a Kai license, you might need you might need a, a conversion, but you are entitled to use. So you, you don't need to purchase any anything more. You just um, download it and you can you can use it. I can also see another question here. Is there a CMC pack with OpenAMP? Um, uh, yes, uh, that's what we, uh, we we are using. Um, initially, actually, the um, more on details, but we, initially we had the um, OpenAMP uh, pack as a uh, included in the IMX7 pack, but we are now trying to separate those because um, the OpenAMP is quite general, so it can be used for Vibri, for example, for something else. Yeah, there is, I think that, that this will be the last question for today. And how I decide what task is better for M4 or for Linux? Um, I think that we more focus on the real time uh, tasks. Can you comment a little bit about it? Yeah, so um, this is quite, as, as I mentioned at the beginning of the webinar, this is one of the challenges when um, dealing with heterogeneous devices. And what is, is normally, so what you normally do is look at the, the kind of tasks that you, you you need to have. As an example, if you need to deal with um, I.O. or fast interrupts, um, I would normally uh, delegate that to the Cortex-M4 uh, because Linux uh, sometimes put uh, a, a layer between what you what you do and what you, um, and or, let's say a, a delay in the reaction uh, because of uh, the, the Linux kernel basically. Um, so uh, based on um, what, what are your requirements, I uh, would put on the M4 on the A7. So one of the things is performance, another thing is performance. So if the M4 is not able to um, run at the speed that you your uh, routine or your function uh, is required to uh, enough frequency, you will need to uh, move it to the um, A7. If uh, otherwise can run on M4, I would suggest you to run it on M4 if, if, if it's easier.
Oh, we have more questions here, but we are out of time. If you have any question, please email us. The email from my email and Stefano's email is in the screen. So you can quickly email us with your question. And I would like to thank you, Stefano, for your presentation today. It was a very, very nice presentation. Thank you very much and have a nice afternoon there. Thank you.